private sector company was not originally designed for people who have identities outside of majority identities. So how do we retain these folks? Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces. I also bring you ideas and techniques that you can grab and use to set goals, create, and unlock your potential for changing yourself and the world. And now let's get to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Super happy that you're taking the time. And I'm thrilled to introduce you to today's guest. Check this out. You know this is catnip to me. Laura Close brings 20 years of experience in the diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI space. Originating as a political campaign and policy expert in racial, gender, and economic justice in the late 1990s, Laura spent her career locking in new structural opportunities and institutional access for historically excluded or, and or I should say, underrepresented communities. She built an award-winning global executive coaching firm with a client base spanning FANG, which you should know is actually Meta, or formerly known as Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Alphabet, formerly known as Google, and Unicorn Startups. Now, as co-founder of Included, Laura and her team have created the first technology of its kind to use AI to help enterprise scale the DEI function. Wow, Laura, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Zolda. I am, I have, I have a ton of, ton of, ton of questions. But the first is, I would love it if you would talk to me a little bit about about your why. What is it that got you so interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion to make it your life's work? Wow, that's a that's a big question. Um, yeah, all right, right to the heart of the matter. Um, you know, it had the the space that's now referred to as uh, DEI has not always been called DEI. It, uh, once upon a time, we called it uh, anti-racism or racial justice. Um, and, you know, one of my mentors in this space once said to me that, you know, every white anti-racist begins their journey with a broken heart. Mm. Um, and so that's definitely part of my story. Uh, I grew up in LA, uh, in blue collar and raised poor communities. Um, uh, most of my girlfriends were um, from communities of color, a variety of communities of color. Um, and they mattered to me, their life experiences mattered to me. Um, and as I um, grew up and my family moved to the Pacific Northwest, which is um, not majority minority as the phrase goes, which um, LA has become, it's very heavily white communities. Um, I was really able to see pretty stark cultural differences and possibilities and pathways and outcomes based on um, structural racism embedded in the institutions of our society, uh, our policies, uh, the ways in which uh, systems are designed to create or deny opportunity and access. Um, and, you know, really looking as those outcomes began to unfold in our late teens and early 20s, um, it was around that time that I was given the frameworks to, to talk about what I knew and what was breaking my heart um, around terms like structural oppression, institutional racism, uh, economic justice. And, you know, they say that when you are given the language to name the things that were before unnameable. You increase your capability to uh, think and, and to act. And that was certainly true for me. And there's been no looking back for me. That's awesome. Uh, you're gonna hear me pause every once in a while after you give your answer. Just, I always like to give warning on that. Some people call it dead air. I call it anticipatory air because I'm synthesizing everything you said and 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 going from there. And the thing that, first of all, thank you for doing the work you're doing. I think that's amazing. 
And second of all, it's interesting to me that you have this contrast between where you grew up, which is in in the majority minority area, and and having that awareness, that mindset of there is such a thing as institutionalized racism. And the question I have for you on that is, can you talk a little bit about your mindset in becoming aware of institutionalized racism? And actually, maybe I should take a step back and say, what is it? What is institutionalized racism? And why are you doing something about it? Mm. That's a powerful question. <laughs> um, institutionalized racism is a, it's a phrase, it's a concept um, that helps us become aware and understand and see the ways in which uh, the institutions that comprise our society, um, the legal institutions, the policing institutions, the educational institutions, the employment institutions, private entities, um, every component, the city governments, you know, every institution that comprises the fabric of, of what we consider to be our society was designed uh, with very few identities and demographics and, in mind uh, and catered to their needs as well as uh, the pathways of access, right? How do you succeed in the legal system? How do you succeed in the education system? Who gets to go, who gets denied um, across each of these institutions um, were designed for majority identity people. Hmm. Uh, those would be people who are uh, identified as male, identified as white, identified as heterosexual, identified as able-bodied, identified as non-veteran, identified as gender normative, as de identified as um, neurotypical, um, you know, all of the sets of identities that comprise what are referred to as privileged identities. Um, and these institutions must be reimagined and redesigned in order to change uh, racial, gender, economic outcomes across all di uh, disenfranchised identities. It's fascinating because it, it it's 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 like you're taking on a monolith, right? You're taking on <laughs> something that is really entrenched and yet you're looking to do this in it looks like in in the corporate structure, like with with the Fang companies, if you want, uh, you're looking to do this in places where people will have the same opportunities, if you will. And so, can you talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind, that notion? Because I've always thought that the, the the key for me has always been that we all have the same opportunity to succeed. And because we don't have the same opportunity to succeed, we need to be extra focused on those diversity issues. Can you talk a little bit about how you want to do that with working with companies to make sure that they're what we what we are calling DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion are across the board fair? Interesting. Yes. Yeah, so it's funny you said it, it sounds like you're taking on a monolith and for sure, you know, my youngest self who um, engaged in uh, political organizing, policy design, uh, and campaign strategy, definitely, you know, as a young person, you want to shoot the moon, you want to, you know, um, jump off cliffs and, and, and <laughs> big impact. And I, I definitely had an appetite, um, you know, for the entire uh, buffet at the time of organizational change. Uh, and one of my favorite things about included the software company that I've co-founded that you're referring to, uh, is that we are a little bit more focused, uh, in our approach, a little bit more strategic. Uh, so what included has said about doing is, um, bringing real time data analytics and prediction data science big data solutions to the enterprise when it comes to understanding equity gaps that are occurring within all parts of the candidate and employee experience. So what would it mean if we were able instantly to see through data science and predictive analytics, 
the exact places where specific demographic groups are disproportionately impacted at candidacy, at hire, at promotion, at attrition, and so forth, every touch point. What would that mean if we could see it instantly and see the causal effects? Uh, and that's what Included is able to do. Um, it's definitely a passion project for all of us. Okay, I guess the next question is, wow, and how? How are you able, is it by company? Is it by industry? How is Included able to look at it? And what are those most important touch points in that process? Well, um, the thing that I would point out is that we have had a lot of knowledge built up in what in what we now call the DEI sector. We've had a lot of knowledge built up um, over the last hundred years about how to talk about structural oppression and how to coach each other in conversations, how to put together in, um, you know uh, communities of interest. We used to call them caucuses. Um, and they're now called employee resource groups inside the private sector, groups based on identity where people can come together and connect and take care of each other uh, and really start to uh, have a variety of programmatic experiences inside the private sector um, that help us to create uh, institutional change. But what we haven't had is big data solutions to partner with that nearly 100 years worth of research and thinking about how we strengthen our voice through programmatic efforts. Uh, does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we're looking at now is the advent of the ability to read all the people data inside the enterprise instantly. And these tools just didn't exist once upon a time. Uh, and certainly the engineers and the technological minds that have brought big data and AI solutions to the private sector did not begin with DEI, right? So as these solutions entered the private sector, engineers were busy. They were making iPhones. They were making Teslas, right? Nobody was driving over on this side of the conversation. And so with our platform included, we instantly and easily integrate with the people systems that are already inside the company. The applicant tracking system where candidate applications are processed, the human resource information system, the HRIS, where, can, or excuse me, where employee um, promotion cycles, pay, uh, tenure, all of that is tracked. Our platform instantly integrates with the people systems, reads all the data, finds all the demographic information, and then delivers predictive insights and heat mapping so that companies are succeeding with their DEI goals in a way that they never thought was possible. Anticipatory air again. I, I'm, I'm fascinated and I'm curious. And something you said just made me go, huh. So this presupposes that the company is interested in DEI, is interested in, in promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in its ranks, right? That, that seems to be a, a, a foundational point here that the company has to be interested in it. And I guess the question I have about that is uh, what, I, this is me playing devil's advocate because of course DEI should be included and it should be at the forefront. And yet, what do you say to a company that goes, actually, I think our practices are just fine. What would be the reason that a company, that the, the, the board of directors of, of, of a corporation or you know whoever it is who's in charge of a, maybe a midsize or smaller company, what would be the reason that they would start wanting to be interested in DEI to begin with? I mean, honestly, Isolda, when you say like, what would you say to a company that's like, I'm not sure I'm interested, I would say best of luck on your way down. <laughs> I love it. Um, so listen, we are a startup. Um, we are relatively new uh, to the software space. Um, our team is not new to software, but our company is. 
And in the short time that we have existed, not only have we been rapidly acquiring customers, but we've been visited by some of the largest logos in the world. Amazon Web Services, AWS, Walmart, just to name a couple, have spent serious time with us trying to understand our approach and what we're doing and waiting till the technology is strong enough to scale to an enterprise of their size. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason that massively successful companies are jumping on the bandwagon and investing in this technology. And I, I don't mean to sound callous, but it's not about the moral argument, right? So what we've discovered is a couple of things. One, I've had an amazing two years of endlessly speaking to private sector companies um, across the world and heavily inside the United States about DEI and the business case for DEI. You know, if we if we have diverse teams, if we have a diverse workforce, if we have diverse leadership and executive perspective at our company, uh, we will create more innovative products. We will capture more customers because our creators and innovators are more in alignment with a greater customer base. And we're able to expand rapidly and dominate in our industry and drive revenue margins. The business case for DEI has been made. Nobody is fighting with us about it. We don't even need to talk about it anymore. I remember once upon a time when that was where the conversation idled. And we're way past that at this stage. The questions that leading executives bring to us are, how do I get to top performing candidates from historically excluded groups faster than my peers? How do I retain them in a company that once upon a time was not designed for them? And I am moving the needle inside my company. How do I find the exact areas within the candidate or employee experience where a disproportionate number of women of color or veterans or disabled employees, so forth, are getting pushed out of my company. I need to know, I need to action on that. I want strategy. I want embedded DEI analytics. I wanna know where I'm headed. I wanna know if I'm gonna meet my goals and I need it now because every other part of the business has this technology. And if I'm gonna to continue to win, I need it now. And that's the conversation that we're engaging with, with companies around the world. I'm so glad to hear it. I think that's amazing. And within that, right, you're, let's say you get to that point where, where your software is able to give them that data. What are the next steps? Like, let's say they go through the hiring process, they find the best candidate from this traditionally excluded pool of potential employees. And then what? Right. What do you do to retain those people to make their work experience something that is in many ways innovative? Because when I started working, nobody gave a crap. I'll be honest. Nobody gave a crap about my employee experience. Right. <laughs> they didn't they didn't care. You're just like, yeah. hey, I just graduated from college and I'm happy to have a job, any job. And yet it's different now. I think it, we're we're in a we're in a situation now where people are trading that that the money for a work-life balance for feeling included for feeling like they're part of the story can you talk a little bit about what that means and how a company would retain those people and would make their work experience something that is beneficial both to the company and of course to the employee themselves mm, you ask really good big juicy questions <laughs> why thank you i <laughs> aim to do that I love it. Um, okay, there's a few different concepts that go into this answer. The first one um, harkens back to what I said in the first part of this conversation, which is that the original uh, beachhead of efforts around how do we retain uh, talent once it's in the door from historically excluded or underrepresented populations who the, who the company was not originally designed. A private sector company was not originally designed for people who have identities outside of majority identities. So how do we retain these folks? There was a beachhead of efforts that had to do with employee resource groups, building community inside the company, um, trading articles, training people 
how to remove what's now referred to as unconscious bias, training people on how to have coaching conversations, right? Really changing the ways that we think and act and talk. And that beachhead has been amazing years and, and countless um, you know, blood, sweat, and tears have been poured into these amazing programmatic efforts inside the enterprise. The next thing that happened was we said, well, let's start surveying everybody to find out what they think and feel and believe. And so surveys became a really important part of HR, right? Employee experience and, uh, and figuring out employee sentiment and then acting upon what we learned. And then surveys became an important part of what's now referred to as DEI. And we're gonna survey different populations inside the enterprise and try to understand their voice all forward progress. But it turns out that surveys are lagging indicators. And by the time you get that information, it's already out of date when you attempt to build a strategy against mm. it. And it turns out that a community of beloved peers who share your identity and a manager who is coached to be kinder and more inclusive in their actions and, and choices still don't take uh, into account the fact that opportunities pathways to promotion, um, you know, meaningful employment experiences can still not exist in that enterprise. So the programmatic uh, was followed by surveys. And now we get to a place where when it comes to retention on a DEI basis, we need to ask, what are the exact inputs to the system that create opportunity and access for career advancement, that create clear cut satisfaction outcomes, how are we integrated as a software platform, and this is the included question, to the learning management system so we can track who's getting access to what opportunities and, and trainings. We can track who's getting access to promotions, equity through the pay compensation integrations, and we can document those systems at a glance, and we can heat map with data science exactly where the disproportionate changes are happening where the disproportionate outcomes are per demographic group. And so the included uh, solution that we're bringing to the market is to complement all of the hard work that's been done with the ability to create instant, actionable, measurable strategy based on real-time data so that we have a full and complete approach. It's, it's, multi-pronged and I love it. I think it's amazing. It's it, there's something about here though that that like we're talking it feels like top down uh, mm -hmm. as far as the the software you know the people in charge are the ones who are looking at the software and all of that. And mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna talk about college for a second. When I was in college and I went to the University of Michigan huge school, one of the things that was an issue is that oh hold on <coughs> <coughs> Oi something in my throat. Hold on. One of the things that was an issue was unless you sought out information, it didn't come to you. There was nobody going, hey, you know what? This is what's available to you because it's just too big a school. It was just too big a situation mm. for anybody to ever come to an individual student to go, hey, how are you doing? Are you OK? Here are some opportunities that you might not have noticed. And, and I'm not trying to sound glib, I'm just, I am sort of wondering about that though. How much of this is top down that the that the management of a company or the leadership of a company mm -hmm. is looking at this? And how much of it is the employees through the company culture get to drive some of this for themselves? That's a really interesting um, statement. I'm gonna answer it in two ways. So one, uh, DEI is disrupting HR in every possible way. And, the, and DEI does this wherever it goes. Uh, even before DEI was a part of the private sector, uh, when DEI became uh, central to democratic infrastructure, uh, it was a disruptive force there as well. And the reason is, is that in order to create equity and increase uh, diversity and increase inclusion, you need to uh, create uh, transparency and accountability. There needs to be fresh air and sunlight on all the areas that are muddy, that are in the back rooms, that are uncared for. That's where bias and inequity um, and discrimination really flourish. So anywhere that you have DEI, 
you have a total transformation and disruption. So when you're talking about whether or not DEI right now, current state in the enterprise is top down, I will tell you that right now, minus instant real-time data visibility on exactly where the inequity gaps are, it's a series of guesswork behaviors. Mm. We've got certain groups within the enterprise who now have a voice and a vote more significantly than ever before because DEI is um, in a really wonderful way disrupting um, sort of antiquated, uh, non-inclusive practices in HR. So employees really do have much more of a voice in the companies that take DEI seriously. There's new pathways through, again, those survey mechanisms, through the coaching and listening relationships, through the organized communities inside the enterprise. But there's still this enormous amount of guesswork on the part of HR and DEI professionals and executives and business unit leaders and hiring managers, and even the organized identity communities themselves, right? So what you have are folks at the executive or mid-manager tier looking inside the company and saying, I think, I think we maybe have a problem with not hiring enough Asian women in the Toledo, Ohio office. I'm doing this by eyeballing the situation. Let's go to the uh, Asian community interest group inside of our company and ask them what we can do. And the Asian community interest group has some ideas and they should be taken very seriously, but they may not cross the finish line because both parties are doing their best minus real-time precision. And that's what included solves. So we're able to create a bridge between the employee population and the leadership at every level. And the best part is, is that the platform really works as a super highway through the whole company. It's uniting all the data. It's giving out all of the heat mapping and instant real-time prediction uh, and insights that the leaders need. And it's able to connect seamlessly through messaging systems with all of the employees in the company as well. And, And companies are really configuring it in the way that works for them. So if they want to unite all the employee voice through the platform, it's a two way system, right? But what we've never had is the truth with the data. We've never had real visibility. And the reason is Olda is because the HR technologies that really read the people data were never ever designed to tell the demographic story of the workforce. All of the technologies on the market right now were designed at a time and a place when it was considered inappropriate or unimportant to know the demographics of your workforce. And so what we're seeing now is these legacy HR technologies are starting to issue these um, attempts, these sort of, I I think of them as like, you know, diet, um, like diet DEI modules. (laughs) (laughs) And they're like, come with me, I have DEI data for you. And you open it up because you're starving, you know, for data so that you can make great decisions, close the gap the way you do in every other part of the business. Right. If you're going to build an iPhone, you're not going to do it with guesswork and eyeballing. Right. And so you're, oh my gosh, thank gosh, the HR tech that I rely on is now delivering the thing that is hurting us. And I needed for so long. And you open up, you know, you look under the hood and you're like, that's, that's not a lot of information. And you're like, ta-da, it's just not good enough what's being attempted right now. And that's really where Included lives. I love the way you put it. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the, the the thing, though, is, and this is something that you said that sparked this in me. What about those things? You said traditional HR analytics aren't supposed to or, you know, it was wrong to talk about or whatever these demographics or maybe even psychographics. And yet, what about those things that employees aren't ready to share? How... I, and and that could be any number of things. Let's say you're not out to your community if you're gay or something like that. And that is something that you I have. I have a dear friend who is a, a white man who is Jewish and gay. And, and something he said to me that I thought was wow, was he said, you know, unless I choose to be uh, open about being gay or being Jewish, I am a member of that dominant sector of society that you mentioned earlier, Laura. So when when he said that, I went, ha, huh, this, this has to be a choice for him because otherwise, if people don't know, he looks like a straight white man. And so, so the question I have for you is in that moment when you are looking at the software, 
What about the things that employees may or may not be ready to share or don't want to share or want to keep private? How does that align with what Included does? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, Employees should always have the right to keep identities private um, that they so choose. Uh, And the role of Included is to document uh, in aggregate populations that are significant to the enterprise. The role of included is not to find, did you say your friend's name was David? No, I didn't give his name, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's funny. That's so funny. My, my brain auto-populated that. Um, anyway, so the goal of included is not to locate your friend, right? And unearth his secrets. Oh, no, no. That's not what I mean. I'm not I'm not I'm not talking about about that kind of invasion of privacy. That's not really what I mean. And I'm sorry if it came across that way. What I'm talking about more is that if what if what we want is to have a true representation of what the employees are. But there are some people who are going, yeah, this is not something I'm going to share with my company. Then how do we then get that? I mean, is it just you do the best you can or is there a way to make safe space so that people feel free, like they can share, or or to I- encourage people, you know, that there that, that, that there's obviously no judgment or whatever, to encourage people to be more open, if they so choose, so okay. that so that the company can serve them better. If you see what I mean, I'm not talking about like digging up secrets. I'm talking more about that 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 representation being accurate because people feel like they feel safe enough to share the information. Absolutely, okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, Yeah, so what we want to always see are companies uh, deploying programmatic efforts that over time consistently increase what's referred to as the rate of disclosure by employees and candidates on their identities. Now, this rate of disclosure is considered to be a trust metric, right? So if a company is behaving in ways that are ethical and inspiring, um, then it is able to build trust with candidates and employees such that over time you see this disclosure of identities, this, this data point increasing. Hmm. And we always, and that's one of the, hundreds of data points that included tracks for employers. So we always wanna see increases in that disclosure. Um, And there's tons of manuals on on how to increase those disclosure rates, right? One of the cool things that our customers do with included because we're a data solution and a data science solution is they use the information that they have to, to show right back out publicly to their employee base and their candidate base and say, look, these are, this is transparently and with great accountability. This is what we know about ourselves right now. This is what we're doing based on what we've learned and check back in with us again in in another, you know, 12 months or a couple quarters and we'll have an update for you. That's one of hundreds of tactics that employers can use to continuously build trust to see that disclosure rate go up. And that disclosure rate's important. We want to know who's here, right? If we have a huge percentage of employee population that's LGBTQIA+, then that's going to change some of the decisions that we make about how heavily we're investing in um, advocacy around protecting gay marriage um, as just one concept how we're considering parental leave for same-sex couples and treating it within our policies. The list is very long. The more that we know about our populations, the more we can act to become an attractor of talent and a retainer of loyal talent when we treat that data with care inside of our policies, right? And you can see that virtuous feedback cycle that happens when we can read the data as well. That makes so much sense. And I and I love it. And it feels like it feels like uh, a curtain's been lifted in a way because mm-hmm. I'm listening to you and I'm going, wow, it, it's a very different it's a very different experience than the one I had going into the workforce for sure. And I'm an immigrant and you can't tell except for my strange name that I wasn't born in the USA. So it's a little 
it, you know, I, the things that I didn't know, I didn't know because culturally there was no way for me to know them. And yet there wasn't anybody going, hey, how about this? How about these are the things that we want to provide for our employees to make them feel like they're part of this culture, part of this company. And so if I'm a prospective employee of a company, and I'm using myself as an example just because, what am I looking for in a mm -hmm. company? What are the things that I want to see? Mm -hmm. Because it's not just, it, it, honestly, Laura, it feels to me like it's not just companies going, hmm, who should I take? But mm -hmm. it's often now in prospective employees going, hmm, who should I work for? So what should I be looking for if I want to work for a company that has DEI as as one of the sort of forefront pieces of what it's doing as a business as far as the way they treat their employees and the way they do business in general, what do I look for? Mm, that's a great question. Yeah, because, you know, the product is no longer the output of the company. The product is now the talent, right? The talent decides where it wants to go. And it's such a great question you've asked. The fun thing that I'll share with you um, is, you know, when we survey our chief diversity officer um, customers, um, you know, they tell us that prospective talent will reach out to them on LinkedIn before considering applying or in the application process, like just message them directly. Prospective talent of majority identity. So I'm, I'm talking about like a white, heterosexual, able-bodied, non-veteran, neuro, typical um, gender normative um, guy will reach out to the chief diversity officer and say, I need to know more about the DEI policies at this company if I'm going to choose to work here. And the question is, why is that happening? That's not sort of the original understanding of, I thought it was just for, you know, folks of, of disenfranchised identities. And the reason is because of that disruption, the transparency, the accountability, the voice, the vote, the intentionality, right? Um, talent is intensively attracted to companies that prioritize DEI. So, you know, it used to be that the way companies would communicate whether they're taking DEI seriously would be sort of the picture, the photograph of the, of the diverse workforce. And you would eyeball it and say, oh, looks like there's some women at this company. Looks like it's a, a mixed race population, right? They look, oh, someone's got blue hair. Maybe there's some, you know, quirky folks like me there, <laughs> uh, but that's not good enough anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what talent's really looking for is transparency and accountability. And again, that's where um, we really believe that data helps really cross the divide, honest, um, transparent, and frank conversations about what's true and what's next. Hmm. I love this so much because mm -hmm. because it's so it's so important to me in in hearing this because this is the innovative mindset podcast right the mindset feels like it's shifting like it's no longer they tick boxes for whether or not they want to hire you it's more like a relationship like your relationship building as a perspective uh, employee or, or, or colleague. And, and so uh, this brings me to COVID, quite frankly, because we've had what, what everyone's calling the great resignation and, and things are shifting all over the place. And this is one of those times where when things settle out, I think they're going to be quite different than what we were like before COVID shut us down for all that time. So can you talk a little bit about that, about how DEI is going to play a role or is playing a role in dealing with the great resignation, which is, you know, people kind of going, that's it, I want to do something else and trying to do something else and going for something that that they hadn't done before. How is that going to play a role moving forward if you want to put your little fortune teller hat on? And how can we as as coworkers and colleagues and, and human talent make sure that it is going into this place where we are really working in and with a diverse workforce that has people included who want to be there. Hmm. Did I just ask you 14 questions? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's totally fine. I was actually thinking um, which of my answers 
to decline that populated inside of my head. <laughs> Take your time. Do, 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 do. I'll just sing the Jeopardy theme song there. Um, I think because I had a strong emotional reaction to the Jeopardy theme song, I think we just dated both of ourselves. <laughs> um, so let's answer it from the employer's perspective and the employee's perspective. Um, so the, you know, the war for talent is very strong. Um, and, you know, quarter by quarter, we hear different uh, frameworks that it's, it's the talent's market now or it's the employer's market. Folks love to pontificate about that. Um, but, you know, I was an executive coach for a little less than a decade um, prior to found, co-founding Included um, with Ragu Golamudi and Chandangola. And um, I can tell you with great clarity that top talent is always in high demand and has a lot of choice about where it goes. And with the new experience of work post COVID, and we still haven't seen the full implications, it's still shaking itself out. Sure. Companies that have, are investing, actively investing in grooming all of their people systems, grooming all of the touch points across the entire candidate and employee life cycle for incredible experience for the candidate and employee. And in the case of included, that means locating and solving equity gaps before the candidate or employee even has to experience them. Companies that are investing in uh, what's now called employee obsession are able to uh, win top talent faster with greater consistency than their peer companies. And on the other side of the fence, the candidate and employee who can take themselves to market over and over and over again because they absolutely can, is attracted in the post-COVID more flat work environment to the experiences that have solved for equity gaps. Because when you solve for an equity gap, say for example, at the hiring manager stage of an interview cycle at a company, we discover a data point that says a huge number of uh, you know, disabled folks are getting pushed out of the hiring funnel. We're losing all these candidates because basic accommodations are not being managed appropriately, right? And say that we solve for that data point, but then say that all of the majority identity candidates who are not disabled, who then come through that process are delighted to discover about all of the easy, accessible enablement. Maybe the volume is louder. Maybe there's multiple opportunities to connect with hiring managers that are not just over Zoom or not just over audio. You know, we've solved in some innovative way based on what our company wants to do and can do. And we're delighting everybody, right? And so the talent is attracted and drawn forward and quicker to sign up with companies that are solving for these equity gaps. And now, you know, obviously our interest is making sure that they do it with precision. Does that answer your question? It does. And it's so interesting because uh, this is this is one of those things where when I look at it from from uh, I'm call, I'm calling it top down and, and bottom up just because that's what I that's the language I have. But it feels to me like it's helpful, not just from within the company, but it's helpful within the way the company does its business, right? So, because I can't help thinking that if you have a more diverse workforce, that you are going to have a, a, a product that satisfies a more diverse customer base. What are your thoughts on that? Am I totally off base? But it, sound, it seems to me like in noodling it around in my own head, I'm kind of going, that feels logical. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's this is actually a pretty well-documented phenomenon. It, it not only, um, 
uh, reaches a, a more diverse customer base, but it drives revenue margins pretty amazingly. There's the perfect story that most people can relate to. Are you familiar with the, um, you know, for those of us who are a little bit older, uh, the newer style of can opener, OXO is the most famous one, big fat knob, yes. big fat handles. And do you remember when we were little, what those can openers were like? Oh, yes. Little slinky, stinky metal ones, skinny ones. Yes, I remember them. They, they would bend sometimes. <laughs> they were made too cheaply. They hurt. Yeah. Like the key that you had to twist was sharp, mm -hmm. um, skinny. Uh, and so the new style of can opener has these giant, fat, rounded key. It's It takes up, you know, half my palm. Um, and the... <laughs> The place that you hold the two legs that stick out are rounded and made of a softer material. They're very large and they're, and your hand really wraps around this rounded hand feel. And uh, these were designed for people with rheumatoid arthritis. Hmm. So this is an example of a company designing a product um, to speak to a specific demographic. Now, what happens next in this can opener story is that we're like, well, screw you, old fashioned can opener, <laughs> right? I don't have rheumatoid arthritis, but the product that was designed for that population delights me. And I will absolutely pay an extra $10, 20 for that um, object. And so when you have great talent from a variety of demographics, walks of life, you know, one thing we haven't talked about that I, I have neglected um, to, to, to touch on is sort of generational hiring decisions, like hiring folks from um, Gen X, uh, baby boomer into the workforce. Uh, but when you have folks with different life experiences based on their demographic origin stories, you're able to more effectively design products that drive revenue. So it's not, it, I love that you said, Laura, what do you think about that? I'm honored, but it's a well-documented concept. And, you know, it's interesting that that notion of uh, what you just said is it's I'm a Gen Xer. And so, in you know, there's we're sort of in many ways the forgotten generation. And it's always interesting to me that people don't market to us. And I'm going, who's going to have more income for buying the things that that you're selling? The people who are in their 50s, 60s and even 70s often have more. And yet we're sort of the forgotten generation. And I've always thought that that's fascinating that that uh, with hiring also that people go, oh, no, no, you're too old. You're too close to retirement. When often you'll get so much wisdom from the person who might be be older, but that means they also have a lot more experience. And so when you're in that space and you're kind of going, okay, let's look at this can opener. Logically, it makes more sense too, because the physics of, of turning something bigger to open that can works. And so that being documented is great. But when you're in, when you're in the thick of it, Laura, when you're looking at this for a company, I guess the question that I have is how, how does how do how does that work? How do you, within with included, help the company? I mean, you said they design it themselves, but how do you help them actually look at it from that more broad perspective of, hey, perhaps hiring somebody who's older means that they do have more experience, or perhaps hiring someone who has a, a different kind of ability will help us with this. Is that something that's actually happening in companies or is the data there, but the companies aren't listening? I, I, if I understand your question correctly, um, I'm we're, at included, we're interested in the truth um, and we're interested in, in the data. So I, so the business case is well documented, for example, that, um, D diverse, uh, high-performing teams drive revenue uh, at you know uh, as some percentage X of what a homogenous, high-performing team delivers to the company. Um, let's look at the data, right? And let's build those teams. Let's solve those equity gaps, and then let's measure the revenue. Um, we, okay. uh, you know, I I remember. Um, when I was building, um, you know, uh, political strategies nationally and, and, and national people's movements in the United States, 
um, black liberation leaders who I got to connect with said, look, the, the, the numbers tell our story. We just have to get to the numbers. And at that time, right, that meant going to the courthouse and pulling U.S. census data, hmm. like paper cuts on my fingers <laughs> to try Sorry. to create, right? Um, you know, uh, demographic census-based data for litigation. I mean, it was like, oh, so arduous. Oof. And what we have now is the ability to find the data instantly, pull it, read it, and continuously iterate strategies based on emerging trends in the data, things that we could not, we could not have fathomed were going to be possible in the conversation around um, racial, economic, gender, and, and other identity kinds of justice inside the United States at that time. And, and so the answer to your question is, let's look, let's do it, right? And if we're seeing in real time, because we now with included have real time insight tracking and prediction capability, that it's that that one of our core metrics, such as customer acquisition or revenue, is slipping in conjunction to changes we made in our workforce or is growing. Mm. Right. Let's iterate instantly, which is what every other part of the business does. Right. If a ship full of shipping containers with you know dry goods leaves port in China to come to the United States, you know, I'm on the Pacific coast. So like to come to the ports in San Francisco or Seattle and um, hit storms at sea, the tracking software for shipping knows when a shipment will be delayed and can iterate a thousand strategies instantly about trucking routes, uh, how to stock shelves, so forth and so on. When to maybe send another ship faster out of the docks. We, we haven't had that information until now, when it comes to driving innovation and market dominance and revenue through diversification of top performing teams. And we now have that data at our fingertips with included. I love it. That's so, I mean, it's just super cool. I, I know, I know, I know. I'm like, I'm, I'm 11 years old now and just, it's cool, but it is. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating to me that, that this kind of information provided it's being actually utilized. And it sounds like companies are, are thirsty for this or hungry for this. That's wonderful because it will give that uh, traditionally underrepresented set of groups more opportunity to be part of the conversation. Yeah. And I think that's amazing. Uh, I, Laura, I, I know I could keep you here for the next six hours <laughs> asking you more because this topic is fascinating to me and it's something that's so important today and as we move forward for sure. But I know you have a life to get back to. So I, I was wondering, I have just a couple more questions uh, before we move to the bonus round. Uh, I was wondering if you could just because I know people learn differently, if you wouldn't mind giving how someone who wants to get a hold of you, who wants to f get in touch with you or included, would be able to do that, like on social media, your website. Would you mind doing that? Yeah. So our website is included.ai. So that's www.included.ai. Uh, from that website, you'll find links to book a demo of our software um, and literature on best practices for diversity recruiting, hiring, and retention. Um, it's a really resource-rich environment. Um, our, uh, our company is on LinkedIn um, and that's also included um, on LinkedIn. And, um, you know, you can always email me. My email is Laura, L-A-U-R-A, -A, at included.ai. I'm always interested to talk uh, to, you know, potential customers and DEI practitioners um, and stay connected that way. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm, it's all going to be in the show notes too, but I, I know people learn differently. So I like to have it both audio and visual. Uh, Laura, I have just one last question and I ask it of everyone who comes on the show and it's a strange little question, but I find that it yields some profound answers. And the question is this, if you had an airplane, environmentally friendly, of course, that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Mm. Mm. Ah, 
I would say stay committed to your passion. I love it. That's fabulous. I love it, love it, love it. That's so great. Thank you so much, Laura. I really, really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show and to talk about this absolutely critical, important subject and also the work that you're doing with Included to, to make it so much easier for companies and employees to work together to make sure that DEI is part of the conversation. Thank you so much again for being here. Thank you, Isolda. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast. As always, you know how you can find me. You can book a discovery call. Uh, it's all in the show notes. You know that too. Until next time, I remind you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2022. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you.